Good morning, everybody. It's really, really an honor to be here. And a deep bow of gratitude to um, Owsley for all of your efforts and your support, your mom's um, vision in uh, beginning this incredible festival, and to the great staff and the village that it took to make this happen. Um, Sarah Harris, Mustafa, and the many, many, many others. Um, thank you very much. And it's um, wonderful to be here with all of you um, live in Louisville, this amazing city that is um, not only speaks the words of compassion, but um, walks it as well. I'm just really, really deeply moved by everybody I've met and what I've witnessed literally on the streets here. And also a, a hello to everybody worldwide who is observing, being part of this. I understand there are thousands that are live streaming, so um, welcome, and it's great that you could be here and join us. And uh, Chimpa, Chimpala, thank you for the, the very kind introduction. Uh, it's just really a, a delight and an honor to be working with you um, in, in this capacity. So I feel uh, really honored that I could, was invited to curate this panel. And we have three amazing scholars, scientists from the Mind and Life community who are just going to be sharing some of their work uh, to give just a little sampling of, of the work that's done um, by members of our community. And before the, we begin the panel, I'm going to have an opportunity to share some opening words about um, Mind and Life and the, the work that we're doing. And um, our work is part of a, a larger community, and we're hoping, and we have very large arms, and we want to welcome um, more and more and uh, more and more of you from different traditions and different disciplines to get involved. And we're really keen on um, mentoring the next generation of scientists and scholars and contemplative practitioners that are really interested in um, embarking on a life of, of service. So. Um, I want to just uh, begin with just a few words about compassion and science. Many think that these two words are antithetical and that you can't really bring, they, they shouldn't be used in the same sentence, let alone the, the, the same um, term. But they, they're is a natural overlap that, that I see. And I would argue that the two are necessary and essential for one another, and that we have to bring together scientists and scholars and great thinkers and humanitarians and activists and contemplative teachers and practitioners all together so we can listen and learn from one another to ask the deep, difficult, hard questions, and together, through our different perspectives, be able to come up with solutions that can inform and truly create um, informed and compassionate action to, to change the world. And I believe that's why um, all of you are, are here today in some capacity, is because you care. And we all, all our voices are necessary to, to listen and learn from one another. And we um, know from the, um, the keynote by, by Ann Curry on Wednesday evening, she spoke a lot about science. And she, she shared quite a bit of the, the headlines about science and compassion. And we recognize that um, helping to look inward is the beginning of being able to look outward, which is then the beginning of taking the next step to do something. And then we're also reminded by the, the um, incredible presentations yesterday from Reverend um, Joan Brown Campbell and Naomi Tutu that um, compassion, real compassion, is hard. And it takes courage. And it doesn't feel good. And the science supports that. 
And it's really interesting in that the, the, some of the work that's been done by, by members of the Mind and Life community, um, particularly um, Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin's lab, um, Cliff Saren, and many others, has looked at um, compassion meditation and the cultivation of compassion, um, cultivation of, of compassion, and we find that those who are truly compassionate and experience compassion actually also experience great emotional distress. That they're not numb, but when they're witnessing suffering, they actually are aroused in a deep way and motivated to do something about it. So empathy is feeling into the experience of another, but compassion is the desire or the act of doing something about it to alleviate that suffering. And so the science shows that, in fact, there's great emotional activation. But one interesting difference, and this is research that's been done with contemplative practitioners, like very, very um, experienced Buddhist meditators and adepts, that shows that Yes, they become highly aroused, but they also have this ability to um, not get stuck and stay distressed in it, where they have this arousal and this distress, but then they can come down and find this place of peace and equanimity more quickly. And if any of you have ever seen His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know this. You could see him within moments with this, like tears, in his eyes, in great care, and great empathic concern, in one moment, and then within a minute later, he could be laughing because he sees some joy um, right, you know, in, in, in another moment, and with a real hearty laugh. So this this ability to have this this flexibility and this plasticity is um, there's 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 great lessons to to learn from that. So we know that there is a lot of science that's going on in the area of science of compassion. We're just going to be talking a little bit about it today. And, and, um, and we know that part of why the, the science has grown so much exponentially, um, in large part to the, the, the work of the community of, of mind and life, but a big part of it is that we know that the brain is plastic, meaning that it can change, it's malleable. And that with that malleability, there is this ability to learn and to grow and to change. And so we don't need to give up on people who are cynical, who may seem like they have a cold heart. But the ability of all human beings to change is really there. And that's what we call neuroplasticity. And that's our, you know, our hope with, with spiritual and contemplative training. So what are the biological, neurological correlates of compassion? What are the qualities and conditions that foster empathic concern? And can compassion be cultivated? Yes, it can. And how does contemplative training translate into compassion, compassion actions in the world? And these are examples of questions that the mind and life explores in, in our work. So our work is um, essentially, we're informed by Buddha's thought and philosophy for sure, um, because of our founder, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. But Mind and Life is not a Buddhist organization per se, but we very much embrace and um, encourage the inclusion of different contemplative traditions into, into our work and into our conversations. And essentially, our work is to allevi alleviate suffering and promote human flourishing. And we do that through inquiry, innovation, and education in the field of contemplative sciences. 
Just briefly, the values that guide our organization, and this is through all our internal operations and our board, as well as the, the work of our broader community, which is really hundreds of people worldwide that are in our net. Kind-heartedness, integrity, rigor, synergy, and community. And synergy, just wanted to underscore the importance of synergy, which is basically that one and one doesn't equal two, but one plus one equals three or more, where how our collective and divergent voices can come together to actually create something, something greater. So our community, we have a number of ways that we, we have community, and I'll just briefly share that. We have a summer research institute every year. Uh, it's um, been held in the Hudson River Valley in, in Garrison, New York, the Garrison Institute. And it is um, this coming together of young people who are um, in their training from all different disciplines with more people who are very established, some really renowned scientists and scholars, and contemplative teachers. And it's a deep intellectual dive as well as a deep contemplative dive over the course of one week. And it's truly transformative into um, transforming careers as well as lives of the people who attend. We have an international symposium for contemplative studies. It's held every other year. And this is also a real mix of um, different academic disciplines, but also a lot of people who are on the ground who are really curious about the evidence, that they want to bring evidence, understand the evidence, as it, it provides this frame that helps them to make sense of the work that they're doing in the world. And then we have a fellows program. And the Mind and Life Fellows program, we have three kinds of fellows. We have scientific fellows. And we have contemplative fellows and also leadership fellows, really important people that are on the ground also doing the work. So the dialogues with, the Dalai, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, uh, Jimpa had mentioned, that was really the start of Mind and Life. It was, and we have, to date, had 30 dialogues with His Holiness. And we have two coming this year, and one that I want to highlight and it's going to be in Botswana, Africa. It's going to be in, in August. It's going to be a public event. Hopefully, a lot of people from sub-Saharan Africa will be there, thousands of people, we're hoping. And the theme is on the African indigenous practice, Botu or Ubuntu, as Naomi Tutu mentioned yesterday. And it's a conversation and a dialogue on spirituality and science and humanity with the Dalai Lama, with a number of renowned African scholars and humanitarian and spiritual leaders, as well as international neuroscientists. But I, one thing about these dialogues is that, to me, it's also a great model of civil discourse that we so need at this time. And we have different grants. and. We have um, Varela um, grants. Francisco Varela is the, the photo on the top there. He was um, a co-founder, the original scientist and philosopher who sat down with His Holiness and um, helped to create, create Mind and Life. And Francisco um, passed away uh, many years ago um, from a serious illness. Um, and those research grants are for young people who had attended the Summer Research Institute early in the career. And um, those grants are only ten to $15,000, but have had tremendous impact. I'll um, share a couple examples of those. Um, one grant was from Helen Wang from the University of Wisconsin at the time. She's now a full f faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. And she conducted one of the first studies through our Mind and Life um, Varela funding that suggested that compassion, in fact, can be cultivated with training and meditation. And her studies of findings found that there is an increase in altruistic behavior and 
associated brain changes included perspective taking and understanding the suffering of others that can happen as a result of compassion training. And another study, Varela study, that we did that was funded in 2014 is by somebody named Daniel Berry from the Virginia Commonwealth University, and he works in the lab of Kirk Brown. And his study focuses on, listen to this one, this is a really important one, bridging the empathy gap, which means he focused on how we can bridge the empathy gap to be able to relate to and want to help others from a different racial group. And in the psychology terms, it's called out-group. So in-group are people like us, who look like us, feel like us, and then the out-group is everyone else. And, um, and so his study, um, he did a beautiful study of randomized controlled trial and with mindfulness training. And he actually found with the mindfulness training, these are preliminary findings that he's ready to getting ready to publish, that the mindfulness training compared to control group, that those participants um, were more frequently helping others and had more empathic concern from um, those from a different um, racial background. Our Mind and Life um, 1440 grants are in partnership with the 1440 Foundation, and these grants specifically focus on K through 12 education, and we're funding a number of um, projects, pilot projects, um, on, that, on that topic right now through this collaboration. And then our um, a recent program, other Mind and Life think tanks, and these are small gatherings we, we fund um, ten to fifteen thousand dollars to bring diverse groups together, diverse disciplines, contemplative perspectives, policy, people engaged in policy, etc. And I'll just share with you one example of a think tank that we funded for this that took place this year. It's called Conceptualizing Compassion. It was co-organized by Brooke Lavelle and Paul Condon, who is actually one of our presenters this morning. And it was interdisciplinary, and it included Buddhist and Christian. Um, scholars, along with um, anthropologists and social scientists and clinical scientists. And in that work, they explored questions such as, what is compassion? How do we train compassion? And how do we measure compassion? And that think tank is resulting in a white paper. And there's going to be a follow-up um, meeting that they're going to have later this year that's going to also include Islamic and Jewish scholars as well. And finally, our um, peace grants are the, the latest grants. And this, this is a grant program that I started, and it came through my conversations with His Holiness, and also it's just something to me, it's like near and dear to my heart that we need to be doing more research in this area. So peace grants, peace, peace grants stand for pro-social, empathy, altruism, compassion, and ethics. And essentially, this is a new research program where we are looking at the cultivation of um, wholesome mental qualities and understanding how they impact not only individuals, but also um, interpersonally. And I have to share with you some exciting um, results. We just finished the application period um, two weeks ago. We had 187 applications, first time. We only have funding for four of those grants, so if anybody's interested in helping us to increase our um, funding to some more of these amazing projects, these are um, two grant levels, 25,000 and 100,000. We had, um, of those 187 applications, they were from 37 countries, and 33% of them were from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. So I'm really, really pleased um, about this, this new program. And finally, I'm going to, to just end with, with a quote that further illustrates how compassion and science are compatible. And these are the words of one of the world's most brilliant scientists. And in 1921, Albert Einstein was quoted as saying this, that a human being is part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, his feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. 
And this delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. But our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So thank you. <laughs>